I always enjoy ministering the word in such a famous and faithful church such as this one. When I graduated from Detroit Bible College 51 years ago, at that time, if you said to someone that your home church was the Calvary Baptist Church of Hazel Park, or the Highland Park Baptist Church in Southfield, or Ward Presbyterian in Livonia, or Covenant Community Church of Redford, everybody knew, number one, you were taught well, number two, you were fed well. And I'm so glad that measured by the decades, this church still has that reputation. I asked Pastor Steve if I could talk from the book of Titus and have a three-part mini-series on some of the very Christological or Christocentric paragraphs that Paul puts in each of the three chapters of the book of Titus. Every now and then, Paul waxes eloquent and his Christology is so uh, sublime that it also uh, takes our breath away. So at the beginning of Titus chapter one, in the middle of chapter two, and in the beginning of chapter three, Paul just talks about the grand doctrines of grace that we have just sung about frequently this morning. And we're going to hopefully in the next three weeks see Christ Jesus high and lifted up and the God of glory being glorified. Now, because you have been taught so well, I might throw in a little bit more Greek and Hebrew than I normally would, but I only do that not to confuse your mind, but to gladden your heart. And that's coming up in several minutes, but before that happens, let's have a word of prayer together, and then we can get into the text of Titus chapter 1, the first four verses. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the holy ground that we can stand upon. We rejoice to know that you have established local churches around the world, and this is one of the best. We thank you for its testimony that this lampstand has shown brightly. But for such a time as this, in the next few minutes that are before us, we do want to see Jesus Christ high and lifted up because we know that he is the Lamb of God who died for the sin of the world. So we understand that when we approach the throne of grace or as we approach the word of grace, we do it with humility. We must have hearts that are open, minds that are open, in order that we might absorb divine truth, in order that we might use it in the future. So might this day be no exception as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose peerless and matchless name we pray, amen. The book of Psalms, as you know, is a 150 chapters long, and I'm sure everybody has a favorite. My favorite psalm is number 116, 116. And I like it because it begins, I love the Lord because, and of course all of us can fill in the blank after the word because, and we just love the Lord because of these many, many reasons. Later on in the 116th Psalm, it says, You have kept my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. Kind of poetic, but very, very true. We do have a God who keeps our soul from death, our eyes from tears, and our feet from stumbling. Having done many a funeral over my years in the pastorate, and even now in my retirement years, Psalm 116 also has these beautiful words. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Now that's a beautiful verse for any funeral service. But what's interesting is that Psalm 116 is messianic, that is, it talks about Jesus Christ. When the Bible says in the upper room, the apostles sang a hymn and departed to the Mount of Olives, the hymns they would have sung were Psalms 113 to 116, sometimes 17 and 18. But Psalm 116, Jesus sung, and in that psalm, he sung to his father, Father, precious in your sight is the death of one of your godly ones, that is, I myself, I'm going to die within hours. And that's 
precious in your sight. Now, having said all that, Psalm 116 is great, but all of a sudden, right in the middle, it says, all men are liars. And, and you, you read this beautiful psalm, and then all of a sudden, you're smacked on the side of the head and punched in the nose. All men are liars. It seems to be out of place. But if there's one thing that's sure in what we call constitutional anthropology, that is, the constitution of man. Yes, he's a featherless biped. Yes, we are sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. But constitutionally, we are all liars. For example, Psalm 58, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. As soon as they're born, they speak lies. Or Job said to his non-friends, Job 13, 4, you guys are all, quote, forgers of lies. We read in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 3, very poetically, they bend their tongues like a bow in order to lie. Then we go to the New Testament, so many verses to pick from. Probably the most famous would be John chapter 8, verse 44. You are of the father, the devil, and he was a liar from the beginning because he does not abide in the truth. And when he speaks, he speaks a lie. So the liar speaks lies at John 8, 44. And then this is surprising. The Bible and the New Testament are about to end. Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter in the Bible. Almost to the very, very end, God says, watch out for those who, quote, love and practice lying. At Revelation chapter 22, verse 15. I say that only because as we approach the book of Titus today and for the next couple of weeks, chapter 1 verse 12 says that the Cretans, that is those who live on the island of Crete, which received the book of Titus, the Cretans are always liars. How would you like to have a congregation where God's Bible says they're normally always liars? And the next verse says this testimony is true. People say it because it's true. It's a congregation of liars. But then, but then, as we'll see in several minutes, we're going to meet a God who cannot lie, a God who does not lie, a God who is no liar. And that is expressed because of the grand and lofty theology that is presented. You might step back and say, is, is that really true? That seems to be too good. That seems to be theologically deep. And Paul has to say, wait, God who does not lie, God who is no liar, you have to believe, accept, and receive these kind of divine truths if you want your spiritual soul to be well fed, that you might, as Colossians 2 says, to be rooted and established in the faith. So let's look at these first four verses of the book of Titus. And we're going to be looking at three major themes or three major movements this morning. The first would be Paul's credentials. Secondly, Paul's calling. And thirdly, Paul's companion. Now, as we go through these first four verses, we're going to be looking at the first half of the first verse, the first half of the first verse, and that's really shallow water. It barely gets up to our ankles. But then, the last half of verse 1, all of verse 2, and all of verse 3 are extremely deep, extremely deep. In fact, we're not going to be wading in water up to our ankles. We're going to be putting on our spiritual scuba, our self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. We're going to be breathing two and a half verses of grand and deep theology, which Paul has to say, wow, I'm not lying. God is no liar. This is really, really important that you know. And then at the last verse, verse 4, 
will come out of the deep end, go back to the shallow end where it's only up to our ankle, and we will rejoice in what we have learned from Christ Jesus and his Holy Spirit. So, a half a verse, shallow water. Two and a half verses, extremely deep water. And then one verse back to shallow. Let's begin with Paul's credentials. What is on Paul's resume? What is on Paul's CV? And the answer is simply two things. First, he says he's a bondservant. And secondly, he says he's an apostle. So let's wade into the book of Titus at chapter 1, looking at verse number 1, Paul's credentials. What is his credentialing? Why is he even saying and teaching what he is saying and teaching? First of all, we have Paul as a bondservant, and the Bible begins at Titus 1, verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of God. Paul, a bondservant of God. And here is Saul of Tarsus, changed by God's grace to become Paul the Apostle. And as you know, he wrote 13 books. This is number 12 of 13. Paul had a one missionary journey and wrote one book, Galatians. He had a second missionary journey, wrote two books, First and Second Thessalonians. He had a third missionary journey and wrote three books, First and Second Corinthians and Romans. He had a fourth journey. It wasn't a missionary journey, but the fourth journey that ends the book of Acts took him to Rome where he wrote four books, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. Then he was released and wrote the book of 1 Timothy. Then he wrote Titus, where we are right now. And then after Titus, 2 Timothy, and then he dies about six months after writing 2 Timothy. So right now, Paul is a spiritual veteran. He's uh, written 11 books of the Bible. This one's number 12. 2 Timothy will be number 13. So he has paid his dues. And now he's going to reward us, the believing community, 2,000 years later, with such grand and deep theology. And he wants you to know right off the bat that he is a bondservant of God, or if you prefer, a slave of God. The beloved John MacArthur, he wanted like his own Bible. So right now you can get the Legacy Standard Bible or the Legacy Study Bible. And he made sure that whenever you come across this Greek word for servant or bondservant, which is pronounced doulos, it's always translated slave. It's always translated slave. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. So Paul is not a servant or a bondservant. He is a literal slave of God. Now normally in the New Testament, you're a slave of Jesus Christ. Here, for the only time, he's a slave of God. And when you think about being a slave of God, your mind might hearken back to the book of Exodus at chapter 21. The opening six verses of Exodus chapter 21 give us this concept of being a slave in, in very warm and tender words. Just to summarize it, if you were a slave, you worked for six years, and then you were set free at the end of six years. But, but, then it's an important but, what if you didn't want your freedom? And what I'm saying is this, your master was gracious, loving, and kind. Your master was merciful and generous and forgiving, and you thought, I would be a fool to leave this arrangement. The world will never treat me as well as the master would. So I'm not even going to give it a moment's thought. I want to be a slave to this master for the rest of my life. And I do this voluntarily because it just makes sense. Now, the master would be highly complimented if, having been with me for six years, you never want to leave me. I guess I've done something right. 
but just so everybody knows that you're doing it voluntarily, I'm not forcing you, let's go to a doorpost and you can lay your earlobe onto it. And I'm going to take an AWL, an awl, and I'm going to punch a hole through your earlobe. And that'll be the visible sign and token and emblem that you voluntarily gave up the rest of your life because you knew and know that I, as your master, have been so good to you the past six years, you can count on me to be that same way for the rest of your life. And isn't that so beautiful? That's how we are to be today as I speak. We should be slaves of God because God is loving and kind and merciful and generous and forgiving. And, and we'd be a fool to think that the world could treat us any better than God does. And the least you should do would be to surrender the rest of your life to a God like that. The God who has infused new eternal life into your soul. So Paul says, I'm a bondservant of God, and boy, oh boy, I'm glad I am. But secondly, he says at verse 1, secondly, Paul says, I'm also an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am a sent forth one. I'm a missionary. I'm an ambassador. And I get to do God's work in God's way in, in any way that his spirit directs me throughout the Mediterranean basin. And Paul would go on to say, because I have this commission, because I am an ambassador and a missionary, I have no time, no time at all, to fulfill my personal agenda. I have no time to create personal fame. I have no time to build a personal empire because the most important thing is to get the work of Jesus Christ completed. And Paul said, I want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And if I can give my life to Christ and his church for the rest of my life, then we'll be in pretty good shape. So Paul's credentials are two. He's a bondservant and he's apostle. Now secondly, Paul's calling. And this is where it gets deep. So put on your theological thinking caps because for the next two and a half verses, we are on deep theological ground. So we're going to be talking about Paul's calling. And God will call him in two ways. First, to salvation. And secondly, to sanctification. In other words, God's going to call us into the family of God. And then he's going to call us into the devotion or the work of God. And those two always go together two sides of the same coin. And some of the terminology that's used is sometimes awkward, sometimes kind of deep and kind of taxes our souls and our lives and our minds, which is good. But God seems to be, in this particular section of these two and a half verses, focused on our Christian living day by day rather than how you were saved through the electing grace of an eternal God before the foundation of the world. So, let's look at Paul's calling in two ways. First, the quick and easy one relative to salvation. And then secondly, the harder and more detailed one relative to sanctification. So we are in the middle of verse 1, dealing with Paul's second great movement after God's call we have Paul's calling. And the middle of verse 1 says, For the faith of those chosen of God. For the faith of those chosen from God. So here it says, A believer has been chosen of God. Your version of translation might say, Election. Another good synonym would be the word, choose or choice. So when you talk about the doctrine of election, it really scares people. So I try to teach it this way. There are verb and, and noun combinations of the same word. For example, there is elect, which is a verb, and then there is election, which is a noun. There is 
select as a verb and selection as a noun. There is choose as a verb and a choice as a noun. So if election gives you the spiritual willies, then how about selection? How about choose or choice? We do these things every day. We make selections, we make choices, and we should certainly allow God to do just that. So here we have in the middle of verse number one, for the faith of those chosen of God, elected of God, selected of God. And I would use all of those three terms interchangeably because they are standard Bible words. In Colossians chapter 3, those of you who have been chosen by God at Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. Ephesians 1, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Now, some people really camp on election and they are so proud of all they know about this doctrine and the doctrine of grace that everything begins, ends, and circles around to this. But Paul says it's certainly, most definitely, a biblical doctrine like the verses I have just quoted. But it seems like Paul's emphasis is not on so much God's electing grace, but on what that grace can do in your daily walk. So Paul's calling, first of all, is relative to salvation, where he was chosen, elected, and selected as God's election, selection, and choice. But what Paul's really excited about is the second thing, which is his calling to sanctification. Salvation gets like, like a third of a verse, but sanctification gets a whole lot more. So that's where we are now. We are at the sanctification stage, which is the end of verse number one, all of verse number two, and all of verse number three. So yes, however God elects, selects, and chooses, the ball's in our hand, and now we can start running with it. And we're going to run in three ways. First, to facilitate godliness. Secondly, to foster hope. And thirdly, to further the word. In other words, because you have been chosen, you get to facilitate personal daily godliness. You can foster a hope that looks at the bright, not the dark, the good, not the bad, the blessing, not the curse. And then lastly, you can, you can further the word. You can literally get the word out because you know it to be true. But let's take these one by one because they are weighty and significant. So in relative to salvation, God's calling is election. But secondly, in relative to sanctification, we should be able to do three things daily, successfully, and faithfully. The first would be to facilitate godliness. To facilitate godliness. This is the end of verse number one. And the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. Or maybe a bit accurately, the full knowledge of the truth, which is according to Godliness, I prefer, according to, to be substituted with the words in harmony with, or in accord with, or that which facilitates. In other words, we have the full knowledge of truth which is in harmony with godliness. We have the full knowledge of truth which is in accord with godliness. And we have the full knowledge of truth which facilitates godliness. Isn't that precious? Our full knowledge of Christ and salvation facilitates us living a godly life. 
not to enter the lordship salvation battle, but Jesus is called Savior about 16 times. He's called Lord over 660. So you're chosen, elected, and selected. That's like the saviorhood of Jesus. But now you got to live day by day. That's more the lordship of Christ. In teaching and preaching, I like to separate them. Some theologians say, Greg, that's anathema. You never, ever do that in public. Well, I am anyway, because I am a Bible teacher, and this is the way I see what's happening. You get a third of verse about election, you get two and a half verses how to live. And that's where the rubber meets the road. So isn't it neat that when you come to the knowledge of the truth of 1 Timothy 2.4, you have a knowledge that will yield, will precipitate, will facilitate godliness. God is quite concerned how you live your daily life. And you can't be as godly as God wants you to be unless you know what God is like. And that's through the Bible, that's through systematic theology, and that makes the word make sense. We want spiritual birth and growth. We want spiritual salvation and sanctification. We want to teach and we want to reach. And we want to reap and keep those who come to the knowledge of the truth. So what we have, we want to share with others. I mean, that only makes sense. And we'll do that so much better if we increase in the knowledge of God and grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. Increasing and growing. God, Christ. That sounds like a gospel-preaching, Bible-teaching local church plus private devotions, quiet time, or as the teens used to say, devos, as in devotions. That is very, very good, very, very profitable. So how are you doing in uh, facilitating godliness? The second thing we'd like to note by way of sanctification begins verse 2. We not only facilitate godliness, but secondly, we foster hope. We foster hope, verse 2. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, there is my opening illustration, God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. So at verse number two, we're given these four words, hope of eternal life. Now, if above eternal life you want to write the word heaven, that won't bother me one bit. But we have a hope of eternal life. Hope is one of the great words in all the Word of God. We name our seminaries and our colleges hope. In fact, there's one on the west side of the state just like that. We name our children hope. What, what a wonderful, wonderful name. But this expression, the hope of eternal life, how can you take it? And as a grammarian and as an expositor, let me show you what People who know Greek look at these words, and here are the four possible ways you can translate this, and all of them should put a smile on your face. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that expression, the hope of eternal life, translate it four different ways based on Greek grammar, and you get to pick the one that you like best because... Grammatically, it would be true. The first is what we would call an objective genitive. Object meaning the word after the word of. And the word after the word of is eternal life. So hope of eternal life means that my hope has as its object eternal life. Hope has as its object eternal life. And that's that common expression, every now and then, don't you get, here it is, homesick for heaven. And when you get homesick for heaven, you have a hope that has its object, eternal life or heaven. Heaven's going to be my eternal home, and I'm homesick for heaven. 
That's good, isn't it? Another Greek grammarian would say, no, Greg, it's just the opposite. It's not an object of genitive, it's a subject of genitive. That is, the word eternal life is the subject, and that subject, it produces, it generates, it creates hope. So it's not the hope of eternal life, but hope produces and generates and invents in a good sense hope. And that is so true, and a lot of you can attest to it. I cannot get through life unless I have hope. And because I have eternal security, because I understand the perseverance of the saints, eternal life produces a hope in me that puts a smile on my face, when everything is falling apart, I have a calmness in my spirit when everything is chaotic. What's going on here? Well, it's a subjective genitive. The, the eternal life produces, creates, invents hope. Pastor Steve and I were raised at the same local church, and the pastor, David D. Allen, would say this every now and then. I can eat anything if you give me enough ketchup. <laughs> then he would say, and you can endure anything if you have enough hope. That's much better than the joke part. And that's what this verse is saying. If I know I have eternal life and it's going to produce hope, I don't care what the world throws at me, because eternal life, heaven, and God is going to give me hope. Isn't that good? Others say, no, it's, it's an appositional genitive, which means that hope, the word of, turns into an equal sign. My hope is eternal life. My hope equals eternal life. A lot of you know Philippians 121, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In the Greek text, present infinitive, to be living, there's no verb, Christ. Then another infinitive, to die, gain. So Paul is just pregnant in his grammatical writings of Philippians 121. To be living, Christ. And to die, nothing but gain. Here, hope equals eternal life. Um, City of Detroit. Well, city equals Detroit. Sign of circumcision. Sign equals circumcision. The temple of his body. The temple equals Jesus' body. They're all over the place in the Bible. They're just given a grammatical category. And then the fourth thing that a Greek grammarian might say, well, no, it, it's what we call a partitive or a holative genitive, which means this. Hope, that's the part, is part of the big pie, the whole, which is eternal life. In other words, eternal life is this great big thing, and there is a slice of it, there's a part of it that is hope. Now, some of you worry about money, and others of you have no problem at all in that area. Some of you have poor health, some have great health. Some have obedient adult children who still attend church. Others are lukewarm, non-committal, or unbelievers. We, we each have our own burdens. We each have our own blessings. And this genitive says, in the whole pie of salvation, in eternal life, there's one slice called hope. Now, some of you need a whole lot more hope than others. And this Greek grammatical construction would allow for just that. So, Pastor Hans, which one of the four is correct? And the answer is yes. That's not a good answer, is it? Whatever ball is in your hand, run with it. Because it is truth. And it's so much truth in that, verse 2 says, hey, God doesn't lie. Election, sanctification, God doesn't lie. That's yours to believe, 
That's yours to have for the rest of your life. In fact, salvation, holy living, man, oh man, that was promised long ages ago. In other words, God had a blueprint for your life long before Genesis 1-1 ever was created or happened. A lot of you know Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. By grace you are saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But nobody quotes verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which were previously ordained that you should walk in them. So the same God of election is the God who has a divine blueprint for your life. And at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to look at you with a blueprint in front of him and say, let's see how you did. I gave you salvation, grace through faith, and uh, I've ordained these good works before the foundation of the world, just like election. So let's see how you did. I mean, isn't that fair? Reasonable and rational? Yep. Well, if salvation and God's calling is relative to sanctification to facilitate godliness and foster hope, thirdly, it's to further the word, further the word. And verse 3 reads in my English Bible, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now that's a mouthful. And what I like to do as I read my Bible, especially in the book of Psalms, I like to reword things. So in my opinion, I like the way I did it better than the way I have to preach it. I would write this verse completely backward. And here's what it sounds like. God, our Savior, issued a command that I, Paul, would be entrusted with the ministry of proclaiming the word. Thank you. I took the same words, but just read it backward. And that's what's going on. There is a proper time. God said, I've got my Koine Greek language that everyone can speak. There are safe roads that will allow missionaries to go to all continents. There is the Pax Romana, that is the Roman peace. And, and there's people who are just sick and tired of all these gods of Rome and Greece. Is there anything new under the sun? And it was just the proper time to have Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And that is for the proclamation of his word, to proclaim, to herald the word of God. If you watch horse races like the Kentucky Derby, that, dun, 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 you know, that thing, that, that trumpet is... It looks like it's four or five feet long or tall. And that's the heralding. This is the Greek word. It's kerux or the kerugma. The, the proclamation, the proclaiming. Everybody has got to hear this because it's the commandment of God at the end of the verse. It's even his word. It's word of salvation and sanctification. And it's a proclamation. We just have to get this word out. When I moved down river 40 years ago to pastor the Woodhaven Bible Church, the airy newspaper was called the News Herald. And I said, that must be the most boring newspaper on planet Earth. News and Herald say the same thing. News Herald, why don't you have it? Herald the News. To me, that sounds better. News Herald, boring. But here, Paul says, we have to trumpet forth this is not preaching the gospel specifically. This is just getting the word out about a holy trinity God, a precious and incarnate scripture. And that can cause us to run with a spiritual ball like crazy. And Paul says, I've been entrusted with that. I'm just a steward of God's great grace. I didn't invent this. All I do is preach it. So, Paul's credentials, they're easy. A bondservant, an apostle. 
Paul's calling much detail. There's a call to salvation and one to sanctification. And that sanctification is to facilitate godliness, to foster hope, and to further the word. And now at verse 4, our third and last thing, which would be Paul's com uh, companion, we're just going to go back to the shallow end where the water just graces our ankle bone. And we'll have Paul's spiritual son, verse 4, to Titus, my true son, in a common faith. Titus, not found in the book of Acts, but he's all over the epistles, and he's one of the great guys in the Bible, the man by the name of Titus. Paul says, he's my true child, that is, I led him to the Lord, and we have a common faith. I don't care if you're Bill Gates or Skid Row bum, you're born naked, wet, and screaming. Everybody is. They're cut out of the same bolt of cloth. And when we come to Christ, we have a common salvation. I was saved out of the blue, and I was non-God. My wife was raised in the church nursery. And that's just God saves us as he does. It's his electing uh, decision to do that. And we have a common faith, a faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And after that spiritual son becomes a spiritual salutation, the salutation simply being grace and peace. Grace is the more New Testament Greek word, and peace, more the Old Testament Hebrew word, charis versus shalom, grace and peace. The blessings of God of the Old Testament, the blessings of God of the New Testament, are all for those who have a common faith. And after you understand how God saves you, he sustains you by his grace and peace, which, by the way, comes from the first two persons of the Trinity, First, God the Father, and secondly, Christ Jesus, who is our Savior. I see that the hands of the clock have arrested me, so another minute and I'll exit. This four-verse chunk is really, really good because there's a stress on God, those chosen of God, knowledge of the truth, the eternal life, his word, his commandment, common faith, and then there's stuff that we relate to, to be a bondservant, to be godly, to have hope, to proclaim, to enjoy grace and peace. And you've heard this your whole life, so I'm going to end in this way. Belief must be followed by behavior. Creed must be followed by conduct. Doctrine followed by duty. Principle followed by practice. Salvation followed by sanctification. Orthodoxy followed by orthopraxy. And when you get these things in order and bask in the glories of God in your salvation, all you can say is thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this local church and its testimony and its witness. Thank you, too, for the inerrant word of God. And thank you specifically, at least for now, for Titus 1, 1 to 4. There's so much in it to buoy our spirits and our soul and allow us to run with endurance the race that is set before us as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.